to this session called Greening Aviation, How Consumers Will Power the Future of Flight. Uh, my name is Kevin Subley, and I'm the project lead for the Clean Skies for Tomorrow initiative here at the Forum, focused on sustainable aviation. Uh, this Greening Aviation session is run in conjunction between this Clean Skies for Tomorrow project and the Forum's Natural Climate Solutions Cluster. Uh, we have a, a great setup for you today. Uh, we'll kick off with opening remarks by Christoph Wolf and then move directly into an expert panel discussion. Uh, following that discussion, uh, which will run about 30 minutes and be live streamed to the forum's website, we'll move into breakouts, uh, three different breakouts um, to which you will be automatically allocated. Um, in those breakouts, we'll have a, a facilitated a conversation with yourselves um, to get your interest, uh, interested comments and feedback and thoughts about the um, initial uh, conversation in the panel and any other comments that uh, you'd like to make and, and thoughts, you'd, ideas you'd like to contribute to the conversation. So um, following those breakouts, we'll have a readout where everyone will share, um, the discussion leaders will share their uh, summary of thoughts and move into a uh, quick Q&A and closing remarks from our own Justin Adams. Um, that's our run of session. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, hand it over to Christoph Wolf, head of the mobility platform here at the World Economic Forum to uh, provide some opening remarks and some scene setting comments. Christoph, over to you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Kevin, very much for, your, for the introduction. Uh, welcome uh, from my side also to, to day two. Uh, I know that uh, greening aviation uh, has actually been a topic of considerable interest. And I want to say also hello to all those who are uh, listening in as the session is actually live streamed. Um, now, let me, let me uh, cast a few words on why actually within the forum, um, the uh, platform of mobility that includes uh, aviation, travel, tourism, uh, and has an initiative uh, since two years called Clean Skies of Tomorrow. And our platform for nature-based solutions are uh, working together on this specific uh, topic. Um, I should say, um, uh, and I would like to start with, with aviation, uh, sustainability in flight has become a topic of considerable public interest over the last two years. Um, and that has to do a lot, a lot with the um, with flight shaming. Actually, uh, Greta Thunberg uh, two years ago and many of her followers and uh, as a father of uh, basically uh, uh, 18 and 20 year old, so we could see the, the conversation on dinner table, basically said flying is not good. Yeah, so flying is against the climate. We shouldn't fly, rather um, uh, basically use other means of transportation which are much, much more uh, economic. Um, this public sentiment was new. Uh, actually, until recently, until a few years ago, basically aviation was accepted to be the industry that probably would be last or one of the last to deliver on the Paris Climate Agreement. Actually, it hasn't been part of the Paris Climate Agreement. It's been covered by a, by a special, by a separate treaty um, in which um, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the industry under the, the, the leadership of ICAO, it's a UN agency, basically agreed on an offsetting scheme called Corsia um, that would kick in by now 2020 and uh, where basically any growth beyond a certain uh, amount uh, or at a certain time would be need to be covered by offset. So here offsets basically were chosen as the appropriate pathway towards actually decarbonization some years ago. Um, now, um, we are now in, in COVID times, yeah, so uh, aviation industry, nobody is flying for, um, for other reasons, um, but eventually we assume this will take up again um, with uh, um, not, not with, the, with the growth rates uh, until like two years ago or a year ago, people pre-COVID, people thought this industry would double by 2035 again. Uh, airport capacity is needed to increase, uh, needed to double as well. Um, and and uh, but as a matter of fact, most of the uh, world actually, especially in developing countries, hasn't even started flying. So we would assume, assume also for equity reasons, we will need to fly to keep the world connected, and we will need to fly more. Now, how can that actually act sustainably? Um, and um, and that has actually brought uh, the conversation in that in in addition to offset as a as a pathway 
which would create carbon sinks. Uh, you know, you have seen the, about the One Trillion Tree Initiative of the World Economic Forum, which could make a 25% uh, percent, um, um, uh, contribution to greenhouse gas, uh, um, basically reduction and, and actually bind uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. The sector, um, uh, the, the aviation sector is on a pathway to decarbonize to find its own pathway toward industrial uh, decarbonization, either via innovation, that's probably for electric flights or hydrogen flights, or or moving into a zero um, um, uh, carbon fuel base, this so-called sustainable aviation fuels, either by second generation biofuels or by, by uh, actually e-fuels, so hydrogen based uh, um, uh, fuels. And, and now the, the, the interesting conversation that is coming up is um, how do how do we bring these two things together? Yeah, so there's actually two camps. There's basically the camp that's saying, okay, forget about technology will take too long. So let's about going full throttle into the offsetting ski offsetting basically build trees not get uh, get uh, basically distracted by by what the airline industry does so that's one camp the other camp is basically saying okay these uh, th these um, these offsetting scheme they're often the often uh, they're not at the same uh, quite quality and while basic trees are burning uh, are being burned so how can we really actually get uh, get uh, um, uh, really uh, make this big and at the scale so let's rather go and avoid the uh, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the first place by going to going to a different fuel base both is probably correct both is correct but there's not an integrated narrative not an integrated framework and and we as a forum think we need to bring these two together there may be a role for the uh, for the financial sectors to basically fund both, but we, we, but we will not get to the root cause nor create the opportunity for carbon sinks if we don't leverage uh, the, 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 the sector's uh, potential for, for, for scaling up offsetting, but at the same time working duly on uh, industry decarbonization. So this, this, the session, the purpose of the session is to talk to those who actually have both in mind, yeah, uh, like, uh, um, like companies like Shell uh, and others that uh, Boeing that, that actually look in, in, into both alleys and, and find, discuss what are the most appropriate ways to bring these two conversations into uh, into um, to, into one such that they are productive, that they enhance uh, mutually, and they lead to what we actually think is is absolutely necessary. But that by 2050, um, this sector is fully compliant with the Paris Agreement, and we can really fly zero carbon. Thank you very much. May I invite? As I said, I think we 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 are happy to um, basically come bring into the panel. Uh, three parties that actually have been thinking about uh, these type of topics long and hard. And maybe I can um, uh, bring in first David Hone, who is the chief climate advisor of Shell. And Shell is investing, actually is very active on the Clean Skies of Tomorrow um, uh, platform that actually um, uh, charts with 100 plus constituents a pathway to, to, to net zero mid-century uh, by going to SAF, but also investing a lot into offsets. So maybe uh, over to you, David, to give us your perspective on that question and, and, and how do we uh, deal with the trade-offs between these different pathways and uh, what is Shell, Shell doing here? Right, well, Christoph, thank you very much. Um, so I work in the, uh, the Shell Scenarios team and um, one of the projects we've been working on over the last couple of years is our sky scenario. And this is a scenario that uh, meets the goals of the Paris Agreement. And within that, uh, we've, we've, di we've dived quite deeply into the aviation sector. And um, there, are, there are a number of, number of perspectives that come out from this. Uh, the first is that aviation takes uh, probably about a century to decarbonize completely. In other words, to go to a, a situation where say all the planes in the world are running on hydrogen, uh, you know, so a completely different technology set. And that, that you know, the, the first signs of that technology don't really emerge until the, the 2040s. And there's an interesting perspective that yesterday, of course, we saw Airbus uh, putting forward some concept pictures of planes that would that could run on hydrogen and, and, and they were postulating that these might be available by 2035. So, so, so we've set up a structure in the, in the sky scenario where 
a number of things happen. First of all, new technologies do start to arrive from about the 2040s onwards, and they slowly penetrate the aviation sector through to the end of the century. Um, as you mentioned, sustainable biofuels, uh, sustainable aviation fuels also come into the picture, but, but they don't fill the whole gap. Um, you, you know, aviation is a very large sector and, 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 and I would expect you know, growth to continue once we recover from, from the, you know, the severe dip that we're in at the moment. And so biofuels act as part of the story. And then the third piece, of course, is, the, is removals. Now, in the sky scenario, we, um, we focus on industrial removal. So that is removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and geologically storing it. Um, but even that technology takes a while to get going because, of course, it doesn't really exist at scale today. And so, therefore, that throws the emphasis back onto nature-based solutions as the short-term immediate option that's scalable now and, um, and can be quantified and implemented now. I think the key aspect of nature-based solutions that's important is that the use of them within the context of aviation sits within, within the context of the Paris Agreement under the accounting provisions of Article 6. And this is the article that uh, accounts for international, for cooperation between parties. And I think it's important that aviation fits in there such that we're, we're, we're certain that the reductions are real, verified, and are not double counted. So this is a continuum of change, right? That, that's probably going to stretch to at least to the end of the century and probably into the next century. There is no sudden quick fix, uh, but the world can get to net zero emissions with aviation on this journey, although that journey won't be complete by the time the world is at net zero emissions. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, David, uh, for, for your perspective. And uh, um, indeed, I th we work with Shell uh, closely on the sustainable aviation fuels, which is not only second generation biofuels, but also um, e-fuels. Yeah, so, um, and there's actually uh, a lot of innovation also happening on that side. Let, um, um, uh, sorry, uh, let me bring in, sorry, I'm having a little bit of this. So let me bring in Darsono Hatono, who is the CEO of PT Rimba Makmur Utama. This is one of the uh, largest, uh, actually, uh, Indonesian um, basic producer of uh, nat nature-based solutions. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, your business model and the scale of it, and uh, how do you see the contribution of nature-based solutions to the global climate crisis? Thank you, Christoph. Uh, good morning or good afternoon for everybody. Um, uh, thank you for the invitation from the forum. My name is uh, Darsono Hartono. I am the CEO of PT Rimba Mahmurutama. Yes, we are the uh, uh, the project developers for Katingan Mantaya project, which is the world's largest nature-based solution project in the world uh, today. Like uh, like David mentioned, I think uh, you know people need to understand more about offset at this time. I think there is a path of decarbonization, particularly on the aviation sector. You know, um, I, I will be happy to share that uh, with, uh, with with using uh, nature-based solution. When I started my company. Um, about 13 years ago. I think uh, people understand and uh, think that it's important to save nature. But I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, people are not willing to pay because offset is something that people are not comfortable with. But I think throughout this journey of the past 13 years, as the largest project in the world today, we transparently can show that not only we are mitigating climate change by, you know, reducing all this potential emission that happens, uh, that will happen. Also, are working with communities, being inclusive, and provide all the things, the livelihood program that uh, we can do for the project. So, 
uh, more and more people understand uh, of nature-based solution. Particularly, I think we all agree that we need nature to survive. I think uh, the next 100 years will be important for us uh, if we want to reach that uh, goal of less than one and a half degrees Celsius, that we need nature. Uh, well, I think uh, nature might not need us, but we need nature more, more than ever. So I think uh, like, uh, I will be happy to share our experience the past 13 years, the challenges that we have faced. But I think uh, it is a, a, a path for decarbonization for a lot of sectors. I mean, there is, uh, you know, this is something that we will we, be happy to do. I think that what humanity should look into this closely because like, uh, like we mentioned, uh, with uh, nature, we can actually have the path for uh, survival, not only about decarbonization. So I'll be happy to share later as we progress. Thank you, Christoph. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sure we in the, in the breakouts, we will discuss more uh, in depth about uh, how you maintain the environmental integrity of, uh, of the nature-based solutions. Um, and uh, uh, so to, to, to achieve uh, your goals. Let me uh, bring in uh, Robert Boyd, who is the Assistant Director Environment of uh, um, uh, IATA uh, or ATEC, which is basically the environmental arm of, um, of IATA and, um, and is working with the whole airline aviation industry to, to basically create pathways uh, to, a sustainable, to a sustainable future. And um, we work, again, we work very closely on the Clean Skies Initiative and uh, where we try to ex actually accelerate and scale sustainable aviation fuel far ahead of the timeline that actually still the sky scenario would, uh, would, would increase. But it obviously, it needs investment. Um, it needs to bring down the cost uh, to make it really competitive. And, and obviously, there still remains to be a trade-off, yeah. As uh, um, for, for at least for now, uh, nature-based solutions uh, come actually at a, at a fraction um, of of the price for sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, Robert, uh, over to you. Uh, if you can basically highlight, enlighten us a bit about the um, the, the Corsia framework and the, the the steps that ATEC is doing in order to actually bring um, uh, sustainable aviation fuels into a sphere where it becomes uh, competitive and scalable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph, and thanks for your opening remarks. And thank you, Kevin, as well. Um, just, just, um, just to be clear, too, I'm it, it, the, in this context. I'm representing IATA, which is the uh, commercial airlines, about 290 commercial airlines of the world. ATAG, as Christoph says, is actually broader. That's the entire aviation sector. So it brings in the airframers, the airports council, international, etc. But just for this uh, for this particular event, I'm speaking on behalf of. Of IATA. But as you say, this has been, um, the way you framed it, I think at the very start, interesting and, and, and correct that there are different camps in, in the way people think about tackling this challenge, this decarbonisation challenge. And as you said, it I think hadn't been front of mind up until a couple of years ago. And, you know, I, I often note the IPCC report that came out in October 2018, and it really identified the um, how vital it is to aim for the 1.5 degree scenario by, by mid-century. And I think, you know, the scientific credibility there, um, you know, made, made the aviation sector very aware that we have a huge challenge ahead of us. And I'd frame it, um, you know, from our side, I would say uh, we don't necessarily sit in one camp or the other, but that every possible decarbonisation option is critical and we're going to need every single one. So... About 11 years ago, the, the entire industry committed to three, to three uh, targets or goals. The first one was, a, was an incremental improvement. That's essentially been done. That was up until 2020, and that was a, a modest annual improvement, and that was exceeded. But we're really at a point where we need much greater an ambition. So as Christoph says, there was an international agreement called CORSIA, the Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme, for international aviation. And it's important to note the carbon offsetting is exactly as you, you stated, that it's um, obviously offsets. That's the primary idea there. But it was in 2016 at the ICAO assembly that the, um, the, 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 the term was changed from a, from a market-based mechanism to Corsair. And the reduction piece was designed specifically to, um, uh, to capture sustainable aviation fuels uh, as being uh, a compliance uh, mechanism, And I think also noting that it's going to be very important as we move out towards mid-century. So 
Corsia does uh, rightly, as you say, start in 2020. It's now um, going to be uh, based on the 2019 uh, emissions, so there'll be no growth um, above that going forward. I suspect that in the uh, early, certainly in the early stage of Corsia, there will be good good deal of the obligations met through offsets. Um, but we are genuinely seeing increasing activity, huge increasing activity um, and interest in in SAF and you know the, the, the clean skies of tomorrow work has in a sense I think brought a lot of uh, this together and a lot of the thinking together on how these ambitions for for mid-century are met. I mean the specific industry goal that has been agreed is to halve net CO2 emissions by 2050 relative to the 2005 uh, levels and I think uh, anyone that uh, takes a careful look at what that really means you know we can hypothesise at the moment we're in a COVID scenario. It's a little bit hard to, well, our forecasts are blurry right now when you think about that. But I think as Christoph said, that people will need to fly again and they will, you know, there's a big portion of the world that hasn't yet flown and it's um, highly uh, likely that those folk are going to want to fly and they should be able to, to fly. So um, to halve the net CO2 emissions, so basically to get down to 325 million tonnes from say 2 billion, uh, tons of CO, million tons of CO2, is a substantial reduction. You're on, you're on your way to net carbon zero. So whether that's mid-century or that's a little, or well, 2050 or what we might more in a blurry sense call mid-century, um, we'll have to, to see. But there are airlines already taking a leading ambition and uh, stating the, you know, their commitment to achieve um, net, net zero. Um, if we think of the SAF side, and I would say um, the industry... Um, does have a preference for trying to do as much insect decarbonisation as, as possible. But notes there will be, I think, a, a necessity to use some some offsets as well. But um, you know, I think a lot of the work that bodies such as uh, well, ICAO initially did some of this work, but Clean Skies has really backed it up with some tremendous um, you know modelling demonstrating that it is actually achievable to get very large penetration of SAP. And the industry is going to have to uh, come along here from the demand perspective and, um, you know, and, and help that become a, a reality. So I leave that, that as some opening uh, remarks, but it's a, it's a big challenge ahead, but it is actually an achievable challenge. Yeah, uh, Robert, thank you very much. I would want to add one thing before I, uh, topic before I uh, hand over for, to Kevin to bring us into the, to the uh, breakouts. Um, uh, so we, we, we basically said, how can consumer power this? Yeah, and obviously uh, some of the airlines with like uh, programs like Board Now or Compensate, they basically give the opportunity for voluntary offset. Yeah, and 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 that actually um, has been augmented by the capability to actually buy sustainable aviation fuel for your flight yeah so to basically which is a more expensive opportunity and within clean skies as we as we there are a lot of companies actually that um especially on the tech side uh, for whom um um uh, basically the carbon footprint through aviation represents a significant and the overwhelming part of their carbon footprint overall and they want to reduce the carbon footprint to zero as soon as possible and they're basically um the, in, within clean skies we bring all this demand for SAF yeah into one space and actually are trying to establish a, a global marketplace where actually big corporate can 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 basically buy um, sustainable aviation fuels and and basically enable the uh, the the initial start of the ramp up so that we can actually sustainable aviation fuel can be kickstarted investment pours into uh, building plans for that and and so we, we we get out of this chicken and egg situation where uh, currently we have uh, you know it's it's not the, the the path is not not preceded because there is no demand so there's no supply because no, there's no demand so I, I wanted to add that but now I give get, uh, give back uh, Kevin to take us to uh, to the to, into the breakouts. Thank, thank you, Christoph. Um, one one quick question that I would ask, uh, perhaps for uh, David, is a, a quick comment on last land use impacts on a sustainable aviation fuel pathway. Um, while you answer that question, I'll uh, I'll address the breakouts. Thank you. 
Right, well, thanks. So, so I won't claim to be an expert on land use change. I, I think uh, Darsana is probably far more qualified in, in that area than I am. But I think, you know, sustainable aviation fuels aren't just about uh, growing, growing crops or, or biomass for, for fuel. I mean, I mean, the market's also starting to look at the role that waste can play. Um, so there's, there's the potential for, for collecting waste. Uh, some of the early sustainable aviation fuels have come from collecting waste, waste oils from, uh, for, from cities. Now, the scale of that is limited. So, of course, you do then have to go into, uh, into biomass sourced um, aviation fuels. But I think, you know, that, that's, that's manageable. We already have a, a very large biofuel industry globally. And uh, of course, that today is manufacturing fuels for the uh, for the automotive market. But if you think about this in in parallel, you know, as the as the aviation market is starting to look for for aviation fuels or sustainable aviation fuels from biomass, the auto market should actually be declining because we're moving to electric vehicles. So I think that the you know that the total is manageable. Uh, we shouldn't just imagine this as, you know, piling on more and more demand on the, on the agricultural sector, uh, because that will be shifting as well as a result of other changes in the transition. Thank you, David. And uh, Darsano, um, indeed, would you care to comment? Thank you, Kevin. But I think um, the key is, um, you know, we're talking about the transition of decarbonization, right? So. Um, what we are seeing right now is uh, nature-based solution is one of the pathway to get there. And our experience shows that not only that we are, you know, reducing potential emission, we're also working inclusively with communities. So it is uh, very inclusive as well as a, a business to be in. Uh, of course, everybody would love to have one day, we are not going to have emission from the aviation sector. But uh, as a land use, um, you know, it contributes a lot to the world in terms of the emission. So one way to to have a win-win uh, scenario is to make sure that we have our nature intact while we are working on our path to get the sustainable uh, alternative view for the aviation. Thanks, Darsono. And um, perhaps uh, Robert can add uh, an initial um, or concluding thought on that as well. Um, Robert, perhaps uh, worth mentioning that um, aviation as a hard to abate industry actually has at the moment, no alternative viable pathway for decarbonization, whereas um, transport like road and perhaps even shipping uh, does. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Kevin. That's very true. And I mean, to your point of um, you know, well, land use change or environmental impacts of sustainable aviation fuels, I'd be very clear when we use the word as the industry, when we use the word sustainable aviation fuel, uh, it does have a very specific meaning, and the aviation industry is. Uh, particular, both both from a regulatory standpoint in what is defined as being sustainable. So all of these factors are taken into account and that's included within the Corsia framework on things like indirect land use change, direct land use change. Um, uh, but also the industry has uh, signed some declarations and this is a whole of industry factor on, on what the minimum requirement for sustainability would be. So that is things like not competing with food, um, you know, not, not impacting biodiversity. Uh, you know, we all know aviation is a very public industry and it's important to uphold the standards that the public would expect if we are calling something a sustainable aviation fuel. So I can say, um, you know, that there is industry agreement on, on that and it's taken very, uh, very seriously. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, 